Well, good morning. It's good to see you all this morning. As, as always, it's a blessing to be in the Lord's house and with brothers and sisters in Christ and those seeking after Him. Uh, I pray that uh, you've had a refreshing weekend. Uh, if not, hopefully, you realize the weekend's not over. you got an extra day this week, hopefully, for some of you. Some of you are like, nah, i got to get back after it. But, but I do want to let you know about a few things that are going on in the life of our fellowship. It's exciting. Uh, we're on the uh, cusp of returning back to some little bit of normalcy within our fellowship, if you will. Um, tonight, we will not have our usual services. Uh, with it being a holiday weekend, we're going to give you some extra time to spend with your family. Uh, so keep that in mind for this evening. So there won't be anything here on church campus. But on Wednesday night, we have our quarterly ministry update. All right. I know we haven't had one in a while, uh, but we're going to have our quarterly ministry update, share some um, highlights of what's happened over the last quarter. Most of you are like, what, what have we done? <laughs> We've watched you on TV, all right? <laughs> we're, it's going to be like, you ever watch ESPN, like top plays? Maybe it'll be like that, I don't know. Or maybe low plays, I don't know. Uh, so, uh, but uh, we're on Wednesday night, 7 o'clock in here, uh, we'll have our quarterly ministry update. We'll have a highlights of the ministry that's happened challenges for the next quarter, as well as any business that may we may have. So make sure you make plans to be here Wednesday night at 7. Now, next Sunday is what I've entitled, Welcome Back Sunday 2.0, all right? Because we're coming back on campus for our small groups. We're excited about that. We've got groups set up for our adults, for our kiddos, for our students. Uh, we're excited. Um, just to give you a few uh, logistics about that or announcements in regard to that, for our adults, uh, currently, right now, we are planning to have one class, but we are ready to have two. All right, we are we we have a plan in place. We're asking if you haven't picked up your curriculum yet, and it's available in the Sunday school room right outside the uh, foyer, off the foyer here in the uh, sanctuary. Go ahead and pick that up, and be ready for next Sunday. You're going to be starting with lesson one. I know, as far as date, it would be lesson two, but get ready to start with lesson one. So that tells you they're going to hit you hard right out of the gate. All right, you've got two weeks to catch up. Uh, no, but I know Sonia and Adam are excited about that, and, but we'll be ready. If we have a, uh, um, the need for two classes, we'll be ready. Uh, but originally, we're going to start meeting in the fellowship hall for our adults. Kiddos, you're going to meet in the children's area, okay, starting next week. Uh, that's usually where you meet. But here's the new thing for our kids. Uh, they'll stay in there. Uh, so when they report for Sunday school, they'll stay in there the whole time until we're done with our worship service. Uh, so the first part, Angela is going to be leading that with our kiddos or children, I mean, with uh, Sunday school, and she'll have some helpers with that. And then they'll shift gears about halfway uh, to kids' church uh, with Lacey and her crew. So we're excited about that. Uh, gives us more time to do stuff with our kiddos, so you'll, you'll see some more things about that uh, soon. And then our youth, they'll be in the youth house uh, starting at, at 945. So we encourage you to come back a little earlier next week. Um, Kind of call some folks, send messages and stuff. So some of our other members that are, are been wondering when does small groups start back, let them know it starts back next week. But at the same time, um, be in prayer for those that still need to, you know, from for health concerns, stay away. All right. Uh, you hate to ever tell anybody that, but we want people to be wise uh, about uh, about those things. So other things that are coming up, I don't even know. We've got so much going on on next Sunday. And we're focused on that. So. Uh, let us begin our time uh, together with the word of prayer. Father, I thank you so much for today and what you have in store for us. And Lord, I'm excited, Lord, about next week. I'm excited about now, this moment, and what you have uh, primed and ready for us to hear from you as we sing forth your praise, as we fellowship, as we hear your scripture read, as we dive into your word. Lord, may we have a fresh encounter with you, Lord, that gives us an enthusiasm and a passion to move forward in the spirit, to move forward in obedience, to move forward to connect with our community so they may know who Christ is. Lord, we pray that today your kingdom is advanced in our hearts. For it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Come on, Brent, please. Good morning. I've got some questions for you. How many of you wear glasses or glasses wears? Okay. Have you ever had one of those days when you've got your glasses on, but you just don't feel like, you know, you can't find them? You know, one of those deals, where are my glasses? Right now, this morning, as I have been out and about, I feel like I've got a mask on. You know, and have any of you gone through that yet? You feel like you still have a mask on when it's not there with you. And it's so strange, it's an odd feeling for me. And then the other thing I'm, I'm, I'm curious about, how many of you are, are, are shoeaholics, have a closet full of shoes? There are some of us are. 
All right, so let's do an inventory check real quick. How many masks do you own? And when you go into a store, do you find yourself going, oh, that one looks pretty good. I, I, don't, I don't have one like that. So five or, more, five or more masks. Anybody? Okay, I'm not going to even count mine right now because it's like, that looks like a first period class mask, and that's, that's a good one for the second block class. Anyway, but it's just so strange. So right now I feel like I have a mask on right now, and I was like, okay, do I, do I not? Let's stand together. The family of God is our first hymn today. excited, aren't y'all? How about that? You know, Brother Lucas talking about how busy we are. Uh, we're all busy, right? Especially with COVID-19, having to do other things and trying to work with that. But uh, I was reminded yesterday when I get ready to come to church, I need to put all that behind me. I need to prepare myself, see what the God, what God has in store for me today. He's giving Brother Lucas a message. I don't know what the message is today. I'm sorry, I don't know. <coughs> but there's something there for all of us. God knows our hearts. He's got a message for each and every one of us today. It's probably different for each and every one of us. But it's there. And the Lord tells us to put all those things behind us when we come into the sanctuary. And I don't always do that. <laughs> uh, Mary Ann's music certainly helps, by the way. Thank you. I want to say thank you because that, that really, I, I really love listening to that, that music before, uh, before the service starts. It really helps to put me in the mood and make me recept, receptive to what God has in store for us today. I have two pieces of Scripture. Uh, Romans 2.12 Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the reviewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve that God's, what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. And in Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Pray with me, please. Oh Lord, we thank you again for this wonderful, glorious day you've made for us, Lord. And Chance to come to your house, Lord, and worship and to hear this message today that Brother Lucas is going to bring. Lord, we just ask that you open our hearts and our minds, Lord, and we all be receptive to, to what he has to say, Lord, and to what your will is for us, Lord, and what your will for this church is, Lord. We ask mostly today, Lord, that if there's someone here today that has not received your wonderful gift of salvation, Lord, that today... Be the day that their heart is touched and their mind is turned, Lord, and they come to receive you, Lord Jesus, as their, their Lord and Savior, Lord. Again, we thank you, Lord, for all you've done for us. We thank you, Lord, for all you're going to do for us. In thy name we pray. Amen. Lane, sort of in line with what you said, you know, I don't know what the Lord has laid on Brother Lucas, but it must be a long message today because for some reason all the message, oh, the, the, the burden of picking hymns today was all short hymns. So we must have a long message planned for today. So <laughs> uh, let's stand together. 553, I'll tell the world that I'm a Christian. I'll tell the world that I'm a Christian, I'm not ashamed His name to bear. I'll tell the world that I'm a Christian, I'll take Him with me anywhere. I'll tell the world how Jesus saved me and how He gave me a life brand new. And I know that if you trust Him, that all He gave me, He'll give to you. I'll tell the world that He's my Savior. 
Christian, be not ashamed, his name to bear, oh tell the world that you're a Christian, and take him with you everywhere. Heavenly Sunlight, number 424. Since he chose short songs, I mean, that's just asking for it. You know, we, you know, we've been in this sermon series, Galatians, for a while. We might as just wrap it up today. I mean, we could do it. We've got a little extra time. So, uh, but we are in the book of Galatians. Uh, we're in Galatians chapter six. We started that book or started that chapter last week, and uh, kind of looking ahead. Uh, looks like we, after today's message, we may have one more message, Mr. Jack, and then we got to figure out what we're going to preach next, buddy. So, so if you could send me your notes, I'd appreciate it. It'd be greatly appreciated. So, <laughs> y'all didn't know we did that. We did sermon workshops together. So, no. but now I tell you, if I had to pick a partner, he'd be a good one. So, a lot of folks in our church would be a good one. So, but we are in uh, Galatians chapter six today. Uh, as we uh, continue to work through what it means to have freedom in Christ, as we examine the book of Galatians. So starting in Galatians chapter 6, uh, starting in verse 7, it says this, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that he will reap also. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the f- f- flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit, from the Spirit reap eternal life. Let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We just pray now as we look to your truth and, and seek to hear from you, Lord, that you speak anew to our heart. Lord, indeed, that we'll be reminded that, Lord, that you cannot be mocked. Father, we indeed reap what we sow. And, Lord, we are thankful so much, Father, for you meet us at that point of need. You meet us at that crossroad of our sowing and our reaping and give us hope. So, Father, I pray today as we work through this passage that your eternal truth would change us. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. As we work through the passage today, we're going to see three things. 
First, we've entitled the message, or I've entitled the message, Seeds of Eternity. You know, as we read this, I'm sure this is a passage that um, may ring a bell with you, or the concept at least, and we'll talk through that as we make our way through this uh, selection. But as we see, we have three things we're going to look at. The certainty of harvest, we'll see the seeds of corruption, and then thirdly, we'll see the seeds of eternal life. And I, I pray as we already have read through that, you can see how that paradigm lays out for us. So first thing, let's look at the, sea, the certainty of harvest, I should say. You know, right out of the gate, we see Paul uh, talking to the Galatians. He says what? Do not be deceived. Now, if you've uh, enjo- enjoyed our journey, I don't know if that's the right way to say that or not. If you've been a part of our journey through the book of Galatians, you know this is something that Paul has said repeatedly to the Galatians. Don't be deceived. Who's bewitched you, he said. He even used that in, in chapter 3. Uh, if you remember, they had some false teachers that came in there and got in among them and then led them astray and got them to really start focusing on legalism, started to uh, lead them astray so much so that they started focusing on works and trying to find satisfaction and, and right standing before God by doing the right things as opposed to counting and trusting in Christ alone. So Paul tells them, don't be deceived. You know, you've, you've been down this road before. I've warned you about these false teachers. Keep your, your guard up. Be on the alert. What does he say there? Don't be deceived because God cannot be mocked. Now let's unpack that just for a moment. We cannot mock God. Now I, have, I live in a house with three boys. You guys know that. All right? there's, there's quite a bit of mocking that goes around. All right? and some of it comes from the little guy sitting over there. By himself. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he raises his hand. <laughs> yeah. Amen, he says. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's, he's quite an instigator. You know, the mocking, the, the, the picking fun and all that stuff. But when we look at this word mock in the Greek, it actually means to turn your nose up at someone. And in fact, this, the use of this word in this context or in this way is the only time we see it like this in all of the New Testament. So when we read this passage, Paul says, don't be deceived, don't turn your nose up at God. All right? Now let's think about that just for a moment. What does it mean to turn our nose up to God? Well, when you turn your nose up to somebody, what does that mean? Help me out here. What's that? My mom's trying to say something. What is it, mama? You're being snobby? All right, all right. I'm going to push back. Right. What does it mean to be snobby? Better than, Better than yeah. I think you've got it all figured out. Don't think that you're high and mighty above God. Don't be deceived, Paul says. Don't turn your nose up at God. Don't think that you're pulling one over on Him. There's another good saying, pulling one over on Him. Don't think you can deceive Him. The truth will come out. As I was reading through different uh, commentators uh, about this passage, uh, John MacArthur, I believe, notes it this way. He says this, He says, you cannot mock God, you cannot turn up your nose at Him. There will be a payday someday. There will be a day when it may appear that you've gotten by with something or uh, you think you've uh, got under the radar, so to speak, but the consequences will come to bear. God will not be mocked. He sees us for who we are. He sees the truth. And what does he see? And we see just basically as we continue to work through this passage, he see, we see an elementary principle of agriculture. You know, you reap what you sow. If you plant a certain seed, that's what you expect to grow from it. You know, I, I, I just got to confess at our house, we're, we've got black thumbs, okay? You know, we could plant, you know, this kind of seed and it's going to come up, if it's going to come up at all, it's going to come up something different. But the, the, the basics of life is you reap what you sow. If you reap good things, the good things will uh, result. If you reap bad things, bad things will result. I and mean, it's a simple, basic, uh, fundamental thing as we think about the certainty of harvest. Now, we think spiritually here, just as we see in this passage, he says what? He says, you will reap whatever one sows, that he will also reap. For the one who sows his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Two passages that help us understand this from a spiritual perspective. This comes from Job 4.8. It says this, I have seen him, or excuse me, as I have seen, those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same. On the other side of that, in Hosea 10.12, 
Sow for yourself righteousness. Reap steadfast, steadfast love. Break up your fallow ground, for it is the time to seek the Lord, and that he may come and rain righteousness upon you. You know, from these biblical examples, we see if we sow iniquity, we will reap trouble. If we sow um, righteousness, we will reap love. These are simple, basic things. And, you know, and I think that's a, a truth that all of us can ascend to, or all of us could agree to. You reap what you sow. In fact, those that have been joining us on Sunday night as we've been working uh, in Disciple You, working about world religions and the gospel, we've talked about so far, uh, two of them, Hinduism and Buddhism, have those same, or I shouldn't say same, have very similar concepts in what they call what? Karma. If you put in good things, good things will come out. Now, acknowledging this, we've done this in this class, those are That concept is a good bridge point for us as we seek to share the gospel, but it is not the same thing as we see biblically. For a Buddhist and for a a Hindu follower, karma dictates reincarnation and their next incarnation in life. For us, as we look at Scripture here and we understand the truth of you reap what you sow, it helps us to understand how desperate our situation is apart from God and the need for his involvement, the need for his intervention in all of our personal stories, all of our personal histories. You know, as a side note, pastorally, I want to encourage you, as followers of Christ, to be reluctant to use the word karma in your everyday conversations. You know, I've I've sat with many a believer, and they'll talk about things that have happened in their friends' lives, or maybe even their own happens, and they'll say, well, that's karma, or karma sucks. There's a word for you. The reality of it is we shouldn't be saying things like that. We shouldn't be embracing that same worldview because those on the outside, as they look at us and they hear us use that same language and say, okay, they embrace all that comes with karma. And what comes with karma is the is an understanding of reincarnation. And we know straight forward from Scripture, we know from the very mouth of our Savior that it is appointed unto man once to die and then judgment. And the reality of it is you reap what you sow. Can I tell you this, and we'll unpack this even more, none of us here, not a single one of us, can reap eternal life unless Jesus does something different in our life for us, unless he changes us. We are all set on reaping corruption. Let's see what this looks like as we talk about the seeds of corruption. The second part, again, looking back in verse 8, for the one who sows his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. I think it's important for us just for a few moments, and I don't want to belabor the point here because we just looked at it just a couple of weeks ago, but for us to discern or distinguish between the, the, the seeking of the flesh and the seeking of the Spirit. Looking back in Galatians chapter 5, you don't have to turn too far if you want to look along with me, but in Galatians 5, starting in verse 16, but I say, Paul again to the Galatians, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh, for the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit. The desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. We talked about that conflict that exists there. Looking on in uh, verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of rage, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and all these things. I warn you, as I warned you before, those thing, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But that contrast, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. So as we think about seeds of corruption, as we think about seeds of the flesh, we just heard from Paul's own pen, as we see here, led by the Holy Spirit, what those actions look like, what those mentalities, what those attitudes look like, and they stand in contrast to the Spirit. You know, if our, if our life is focused on those worldly things, if our life is focused on things against the Spirit, it reaps corruption. Interesting, again, as we look at some of the words that Paul chooses to use here, this word for corruption, as we unpack it, we see it carries with it um, a rather grotesque smell, a smell of decaying meat. little inside track into the butler house. So he's like, oh, this ought to be good if you're talking about decaying meat. Oh, this ought to be real good. Uh, we've got uh, uh, 
a Whirlpool refrigerator at our house, okay? We've had it for about three years. And uh, we're not usually those people that get extended warranties, okay? All right? I know some of you are. Nothing against you, okay? All right? But for some reason, we did this time, and I'm thankful we did, all right? Our fridge has been on the fritz. Hey, that's pretty good. It's alliteration. Note that. Uh, Our fridge has been on the fritz for a while, for well over a month. And we've had guys come out and look at it, you know, through the, the, the warranty service. And one guy said he fixed it. He didn't. We just got a new guy. All this stuff. We're still battling it. Well, what's happened, okay, is the refrigerator. We've got one of those. The fridge is up top and the freezer's in the bottom. Okay, fancy stuff. Came from George Jetson. I don't know. All right? So the top is still working well, but the bottom's not. Had a lot of frozen food in there. A lot of meat in there. All right? Well, come time, we had to clean it out. All right, Laura so graciously did that, put it in a black trash bag in the, in the garage. And, you know, we have a kid at our house that, learns, that has learned to drive, and he's got his license now, all right? All right, his name is Caleb, for those watching at home. And one of his jobs is taking off the garbage, all right? But, you know, and, and you guys, not that this ever happens at your house or you know of anybody that's like this, you know, teenagers automatically just do whatever you tell them to do, right? All right, okay, yeah, that's yeah. Uh, <laughs> Caleb's hiding up in the sound booth. But, you know, if that bag sat there too long, it might get a little, mm, you know what I'm talking about, in the summer heat. It might have what Caleb likes to say, worms on it. I don't, they'll let you unpack that. All right? But the fact of the matter is, here, there at our house, we, we got familiar with that smell for a little while. All right? Of that decaying meat smell. Some of you are like, this is gross, Lucas. Thanks for sharing this with us. Now, I will say, he took, took the garbage off yesterday. All right? We'll give him his allowance now. But I share that with you because there's, there's opportunities throughout our own life where we've, we've probably smelt some of this or had to deal with things like that. And to bridge that imagery for us, when we seek the things of the flesh, we seek the things of the world, what we get back is decay. What we get back is rancid meat. We get decomposing bodies back. And that's what this word carries with it. You know, on the surface, corruption, you're like, hey, but that's the imagery. And when we pursue the things of our flesh, we pursue the things that we think make us happy, that are self-centered, that are, that are prideful, we get back garbage. Maggot-infested garbage. That's what we get back. But we live in a world that's happy with that. Is happy with that because they know no better. I'm so thankful as we look at this and we understand that indeed this truth holds that you reap what you sow. And every one of us has deserved that corruption. Every one of us has deserved that, that, that rancid filth as a return. Every one of us deserves condemnation before God. But you know what? God in His grace intervened. He stepped in and he said, you deserve condemnation. You deserve death. But I offer to you my son. I offer you to you my son, Jesus Christ. Catching us up to speed here in our slides, I apologize. He offers hope. He can't be mocked, but in turn what he does for us, he offers us hope. Jesus comes and he sows righteousness and we get to reap eternal life. We sow wickedness, and He reaps our death. Think about that just for a moment. God, in His graciousness, intervenes in our lives. We deserve death. We have sowed unrighteousness. We have sowed filth. We have sowed immorality. We have, those are the seeds we've planted. And what should come forth is death. What should come forth is condemnation, decomposition, corruption. That's what should come forth. But because of God's grace, he intervenes and says, yes, you have planted this seed, but Jesus is going to stand in your stead, and now you can experience eternal life. All of that is available to all of us through faith in Jesus Christ. And then he takes our death. He takes our condemnation for us. You know, there may be some of you here or some of you watching or watching later that have 
tried your best, and just as Paul was writing here, you know, don't be deceived, God will not be mocked. You have tried your best to make, make it happen on your own. You've tried your best to find peace. You've tried your best to find a purpose. You're trying your best to, you know, when it all comes down to the final wash, if you will, that all your good stuff will outweigh your bad. Can I tell you, it won't. Because all you can reap is corruption. But because of Jesus Christ, though, you can find hope. You can find eternal life because He intervenes in our life. He offers hope to those that are destined for destruction. And I think it's important for us as we we look at this and try to understand um, how this transformation takes place. You know, in order for us to sow the Spirit, because each and every one of us is, is, is born into this world seeking the flesh, seeking the pride, sowing the flesh, and facing destruction, in order for us to sow the Spirit to reap eternal life, there has to be a change that happens in us. Christ has to to come in and, like I said, intervene in our own personal stories. He has to bring a transformation to us. A couple of passages that remind us, these are very familiar to you. Uh, Many of you may remember of of, uh, uh, Jesus' encounter with Nicodemus in John chapter 3, starting in verse 5. He says, Uh, Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the spirit is spirit. In John, excuse me, in 2 Corinthians 5, 16 and 17, From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we were once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, part you may be more familiar with, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, what? There are new creations. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Before Jesus, we reap corruption. We reap destruction. But after Jesus, through faith, through being born again, trusting in Him, the Spirit comes and changes our nature. Now we're able to sow seeds of righteousness. Now we're able to plant things that are of the Spirit and able to reap the benefits of that. Can I tell you this, though? I know our slides are all out of whack, and don't worry about it, we'll get there. Uh, Can I tell you this? Even after we experience that change, even after our nature is changed and we are now able to seek the things of the Spirit, we still find ourselves longing for things of the flesh. We do. It's just, unfortunately, it's part of our broken nature that's being transformed. You know, in that moment, that, that season that you first realized that you needed Christ and, and you experienced the, the power of His salvation, God could have easily just eradicated that sinful nature from you. But He chose not to. He chose to leave it there so that through your weakness, you would grow in your dependency upon Him. That your faith would grow. So as you seek to sow the seeds of the Spirit, as you seek to plant seeds of righteousness and produce that eternal life within you and an eternal life in the life to come, as we'll see in a moment, there still is that calling of the old life that calls to us. And I can tell you from my own personal experience, there's been seasons where I've, I've planted seeds of flesh, even as a believer. And I think if we were all honest, we, there's every, every day that we live, every week that we live, we fall into that same old trap. But can I tell you this? As you've sowed those seeds, as you've planted those seeds of the flesh as a follower of Christ, it produces a different response now, I pray. I pray that it produces guilt. I pray that it produces a broken heart now. I pray that it produces godly sorrowfulness where you realize that is not the field you need to be planting in. That is not the place that you need to be. In fact, I would say, and granted, I realize this can carry with it a negative aspect, but I would say that guilt can be a friend to us as a follower of Christ when we begin to sow seeds of the flesh. Because when that guilt shows up, it tells us this is not for God's children.
You may know some people that, that say they're a Christian, and, and, and indeed they may be, and that's, that's something between them and the Lord. Now, I pray they are. But on the surface, you would say that maybe they're miserable. And there may be someone that comes to church on a regular basis, maybe someone that openly professes Christ, but if you look at their life and look how they handle their life, they're miserable. Can I tell you why that probably is or why that is? If they're a follower of Christ and they're pursuing things of the world, if they're planting the fleshly things, what are they getting back? Rancid meat. They're getting back garbage. And not to play on the words or be silly, but when you're faced with something disgusting, that's how you respond. You're miserable. When Christ has changed your heart and you continue to wallow in the filth, and I'm not saying that's what Neil does, I'm saying the word. <laughs> I want to make that clear for the people in the video. But no, when we continue to wallow in the filth, we will be miserable. So if you're here today and you're saying, you know, I'm, I know I'm a follower of Christ, but right now I'm just miserable in my spirituality. What seeds are you planting? Are you planting seeds of the Spirit or are you planting seeds of the flesh? I'm not saying that uh, every time that we go through what some people may call a dark night of the soul or struggle spiritually, that it's all because of our own sin. I, I definitely understand that there's times of testing and all that as well. I think it's important for us first to look in the spiritual mirror and see if there's something in our life that we need to get right. And maybe you can think of someone that's near and dear to you that's struggling spiritually and you know that just from the fruit of their life, that misery is, is a product of what they're sowing. I encourage you to commit to prayer to pray for them. If their eyes will be seen to the mess that they're in as a result of their own choices. And then pray for each other, as we've seen as we work through the book of Galatians. But pray for each other, but pray for ourselves, that we would be uh, continuously examine ourselves and know that our nature, our appetites are what they should be. So we see indeed that the harvest will come. You will reap what you sow. God will not be mocked. Some sowed seeds to the flesh which reap corruption, reach, which reap uh, destruction. But God does something about it. Through His grace, He offers hope through Jesus Christ. Through the righteousness that is planted through Jesus, we can have eternal life. What does that look like for us as we try to understand what it looks like to, to, to sow seeds of eternal life? This last part, as we see here, those in step with the Spirit, that's what we reap. Yes, we think eternally, we think of the, the years to come, or, or uh, heaven, we think of that. But we think also of the, of the now. You know, you've heard me talk before in this context and in Disciple You, this whole understanding of the already but the not yet, the blessings of Christ. You know, Jesus says, I've come, they may have life and they may have it abundantly. Like, yes, he's pointing to the eternal, but he's talking about right now. You know, if we're sowing seeds of the Spirit, we can experience those benefits of that, that sowing now. You know, just as we saw just a couple weeks ago, and we just read, the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love. Joy. Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those things are manifest in our life. As we're sowing seeds of the Spirit, as we're in step with the Spirit. But just as we see in this passage here, that's not always easy, is it? Let us not, let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. Several things there, but let's, let's first focus on just a... a this aspect of growing weary. You know, Paul says, don't grow weary in doing good. Now, if we've worked through the book of Galatians, you're, you're probably familiar with Paul's list of the things that to do, the things that are good that we should be doing. Listen to this. First off, we need to, and hopefully this serves as a good summary for you. Jack will check you later. So, all right, keep it up. All right, pursue right doctrine. Love your neighbor as yourself. Keep in step with the Spirit. Restore the fallen brethren. Bear each one each another's burdens. Examine yourself. These are just a short list of the things that Paul talks about in the book of Galatians as being characteristics of the community of faith. And he says, don't grow weary in doing those things. Keep after it. Don't give up. Now, as I think of that, I can't help but be reminded of William Carey, and I believe I've shared this example with you before. A missionary to India. God just placed upon his call India. 
and those of the Hindu people and taking the gospel to them. So in 1793, he packs up everything he has and he moves to India to be a missionary, to share the gospel. And he does all that he can to contextualize the message, to connect with the indigenous people there. Year one goes by, no one becomes a follower of Christ. Do not grow weary in doing what is good. Year two goes by, no one. Year three, year four, year five. I mean, he has moved everything, all of his resources, all of his life. He has uprooted from home, brought it to India. He's five years in, do not grow weary in doing what is good. Year six goes by, no one. But in year seven. In year seven, he gets his first believer. In year seven, the Lord graciously allows him to see that first gentleman accept Christ. And then the explosion that happens after that. Seven years he labored among these people. Do you think there was moments where he grew weary? <laughs> you bet. Probably week one. It's not easy to do what's right. It's not easy to do what's good at all times. But just as Paul tells the Galatians here, do not grow weary in doing what is right. Do, do not grow weary in doing what is good. You know, whether we're thinking about a mission context that we talk about William Carey, or whether we're thinking about just everyday life when we're seeking to, to do good, seeking to do righteousness to other people. Maybe we're, we're trying to be kind and compassionate to someone and that we're not getting any kind of response. All we get back is ungratefulness. All we get back is, is, is mean-spirited comments. All we get back is maybe ridicule. Or maybe we're trying to meet people at a point of need, whether we're talking about physical needs or emotional needs or spiritual needs, and we just get back tons and tons of more needs. And we just find ourselves surrounded by needy people. Do not grow weary in doing what is good. We could go on and on and on and talk about different scenarios and different circumstances that will wear us out spiritually. And just as Paul told the Galatian believers, do not grow weary in doing what is good. Because if we are indeed those that plant the seeds of the Spirit, if we're indeed those who have had a changed nature through the work of Jesus Christ, the gospel itself is embedded in our life. And the gospel itself encounters the needy, encounters the great, ungrateful, encounters the sinful, encounters those that sow the seeds of the flesh in grace. And it does not grow weary in doing what is right. So church, as you consider yourselves as ambassadors of Christ, as you consider yourselves those that plant seeds of the Spirit and are looking forward to eternal life and, and, and are acknowledging the presence of the fruit of the Spirit in your life now, know that we are to persevere. We are to continue to do good no matter what comes down the pipe at us. We are to continue to be patient. Pastorally, I feel like that is the hardest fruit of the Spirit to manifest. But we are continuing to be patient. For just as we see in this passage, it says what? Let us not grow weary for doing good, for in due season we will reap. In due season. When the time is right. Not to be too cliche, but we all know that God's timing is not like ours. His is perfect. Ours is flawed. Ours is driven by pride often. His timing is perfect. It is also interesting that the very word uh, or word uh, group that is used here for this uh, given time is also used in Galatians 4.4. 4, when it says, When the fullness of time was right, God sent forth His Son. So the very emergence of Christ into the world when the time was right. Then it's also used a little bit later as we see in 1 Timothy 6.15 when it talks about when the fullness of time was right came the appearing of Christ, that second coming. So as we await 
that blessed day as we await our hope in Christ when He returns and all things are, are set in order. Let us not grow weary of doing what is right. Let us continue to persevere in planting seeds of the Spirit. And that last verse tells us this as we wrap things up. It says, So then, as if we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Let us continue to persevere as we look forward to the day when we will reap eternal life. We continue to do good to those that are lost, so they may see Christ, so they may know that Christ has a, a plan and purpose for their life. They may know that there is hope in Jesus Christ by looking at us and our perseverance in doing what is right, our perseverance of, of allowing Christ to be seen in us. But then as it goes, it makes sure, it makes a, a special comment here. It says, especially to the household of faith, let us continue to do good to our brothers and sisters in faith, those other believers because just as you need it and I need it, we all need encouragement to continue to run the race. Not only encouragement, but too, as we've said in the weeks gone by, and we've seen how the Lord has begun to work in our fellowship, the world looks at us and how we treat each other. If we continue to do good to each other, we continue to love each other, the world will know that the Lord is real. And they'll long for Him. They will long to forsake the rancid meat of their own uh, reaping and sowing and embrace the eternal life that comes with uh, trusting in Jesus Christ. So I encourage you this morning as we wrap things up to consider these three questions or three thoughts. First off, you know what seeds are you planting? You look at your life, what are you planting right now? I'm not talking about corn or anything. It's not even the right season. See, I don't even know what I'm talking about in that regard. What I do know what I'm talking about is when we reap or when we plant seeds of the flesh, we get corruption, we get destruction, we get filth. But when we plant seeds of the Spirit, we get eternal life. So for you, what seeds are you planting today? I encourage you today to, com to commit this very moment to follow the Spirit. You know, there may be some of you here that are watching now or later that say, you know, I need, I need to get off this track. I need to get off this track of, of planting the flesh. And I need to be rescued from that. And I want to commit to follow the Spirit. Well, the only way that you can do that is by placing your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ. By trusting Him with your, your life. Asking for forgiveness of your sins and realizing the only hope that you have is in Him. If that's something you feel like you need to do, I encourage you, if you're watching online or later, to, to send us an email to our, our, our website address or to, through our Facebook. Or if you're here today, to stick around and talk to me a little bit later or talk to one of our church members. Or maybe you're here this morning and say, you know, I know I'm a follower of Christ. I know Christ has made a difference in my heart. But I need to recommit myself to be planting seeds of the Spirit. I need to get out of the way. Because if I've looked back behind me, that row is full of corruption. That's what it's yielded. And I know that there's something greater in me than that because of what Christ has done. And maybe today you need to recommit the planting of the Spirit. But as we've said over and over again, do not grow weary in doing what is good. I want to come back to one little thing as we wrap up. If you look back... In verse 9 it says, Let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not, what? Give up. Persevere. And can I tell you, you can't do that on your own. Only the Spirit at work in you can allow you to persevere. But you must stay in step with the Spirit every step of the way. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for this opportunity to reflect on Your truth and its challenges. I pray this morning as we Conclude our service, Lord, that your, um, your Spirit will move freely in a, within us. Lord, if there's one here or one watching, Lord, that doesn't know you, that has continued to, to sow seeds of the flesh and they keep coming up empty, as far as with hope, but Lord, they find themselves in the midst of destruction and condemnation, but they long to escape. Lord, help them to know that Jesus is that hope. Lord, help them to take steps towards you. 
Or Father, I pray for those that are here that, that, Lord, they know they belong to you, but they have found themselves doing their own thing, sowing seeds of the flesh. And I, I pray that um, you help them to be mindful of the great life they have in Jesus Christ and to trust him and forsake their pride and to submit to the Spirit. And for all of us, Father, let us not grow weary of doing what is good. Allow the Spirit to direct us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, as we prepare to sing our invitation, I encourage you, if you'd like to come and pray at the altar, the altar is always open. You're welcome to pray where you are. If you need to speak to someone, I'll be available after the service. You'll feel come and lead us, brother. in a moment, but I do want to just take a quick note. Uh, I just want to apologize to Neil for pointing out wallowing in the middle of service, I think, especially that point. It reminds me of a, a video I'd seen um, that kind of circulated among pastors and it had this pastor one day and he just had a rough morning and uh, he eventually just, he had an event that happened that the straw that broke the camel's back and he came into the service one day and he just slammed his Bible down and he said, I've had it. And he says, I know you're not supposed to say who the worst sinner here is, but it's you. It's you. And he starts pointing. So I wasn't doing that to Neil, just so you know. I mean, I leave that to him and the Lord, but I'm just saying I wouldn't. Yeah. Uh, but I wanted to clarify that for those watching at home. All right. So I'll point at somebody else next week. I, but I do want to continue to keep missions in front of us. As you know, I know part of uh, the fabric of, of Echota's history has been its commitment to missions. Uh, so even in times such as these, you know, to continue to keep our eyes on the nations and how we can be a part of the Great Commission. So uh, go ahead and if you'll show this video. Thank you. I'm Paul Carr and I'm here with Samaritan's Purse in Beirut, Lebanon, where we're responding to the deadly explosion that happened in the center of Beirut on August 4th. Thousands of homes have been completely destroyed, electricity has been knocked out, and food is in an absolute shortage. Alongside our church partner, Samaritan's Purse are distributing tops, hygiene kits, solar lights, and food parcels. The prayers are saying, God, I'm going to give you a 
كيف يسوع سمك سوا خبز بالبحر بحر هيك بيصير بيوت رزقة Thank you so much for all of your prayers and support. We really appreciate them. And we just ask that you continue to pray for the people of Lebanon through this time. Thank you. 